En el siglo XX, millones y millones de personas In the 20th century, millions of human beings have had to emigrate from their country of origin. The charity Aid to the Church in Need has helped a great many refugees across the nations for more than 50 years. The material help aids the promotion of Christian faith and evangelization. Today, we would like to present a quite remarkable emigration, notably that of the Carmelite sisters who are emigrating from Iceland to Norway. This extraordinary film refers to one of our charity's most important priorities, notably the support given to contemplative communities in the church. These deeply moving images tell the story of the birth of a convent north of the Arctic Circle. You will witness how a gap of coldness between Christians existing for many centuries can be bridged in a short time. Here you will see how prayer saves threatened lives. The scenario is that of a country, in this case Norway, where the rate of abortion and suicides is the highest in Europe. The camera follows the meanderings of the fjords and the corridors of the cloister. Through the consecration of the convent, right up to the moment the doors close forever to the visitor. As there were fewer and fewer sisters here in northern Norway, I had invited the sisters of Mother Teresa to come. They had accepted and promised to come, but didn't after all. Then it became apparent that the Carmelite sisters on Iceland wanted to make a new foundation, as they were too many for one monastery, and therefore I invited them to come here, because I believe that the contemplative aspect of the religious life is something that is very important for the Church. And now there are other needs, especially spiritual needs, that are in focus. So therefore, I wanted us to have a contemplative monastery where people could see that there exists something more than just working for money and doing an effort in this world. We got this piece of work as we usually do. It was advertised in the newspaper that a monastery was going to be built in Tromsø, and as usual, we asked to get the documentation sent to us. And it was with a considerable amount of reflection that we went there. 
Our conceptions, and mine as well, of monasteries and nuns were rather vague and remote, so I suppose I had an idea that we were going to something that was dark and dismal, and a little occult, and very mystical. And so we attended this first meeting rather reverently. You could say that when Steinar first came and told me that we were going to start building a monastery, I had some problems with it. I also thought that it could offer, well, something out of the ordinary. I didn't really want to do it in the beginning, but of course we had to take the job. And as I have said earlier, it is the most beautiful job we have ever had here as building contractors, northern Norwegian building contractors. It has truly been an experience. And to be on a roof hammering and pouring concrete and then hear chanting from the inside of the monastery, it is an experience that made a great impression on us. During the daily work, we didn't really notice it much. You know, it is unfamiliar for us that someone prays for us and includes us in their prayers. But it is one of the first things that I remember. The sisters told me that they were going to pray for me, for my family, for my mother. And this is something we all experience here. The very first time the excavator came, we had a little funny episode. The name of the man who was going to do the digging was Oswald Mirvang. The sisters were talking together about where to make the potato field. And then Oswald said that he could prepare the land for a potato field on a spot, there, on the upper side. And the sisters replied, yes, Oswald, if you do prepare the potato field for us, then we will prepare a place for you in heaven. I was very impressed by the fact that they came to Norway to start such a community here in Tromsø. At the same time, I was very impressed that they dared to come and that they had a task to take care of that nobody before had tried to begin. Knowing that 12 nuns came from a monastery in Iceland to stay here to pray for the city, for the country, for the people, I thought it was fascinating, it was fantastic.
A Carmelite life is two-dimensional. On the one hand, a community that lives in the particular monastery. On the other hand, a secluded life of deep unity with God. Consequently, every sister spends a predetermined amount of time in her cell, one to one with God. I knew that the Carmelite sisters belonged to one of the strictest religious orders that exist, with a strict enclosure and with bars between the sisters and the guests. One must see the sisters through grills. And I thought that these grills would be impossible for most of the non-Catholics in Tromso to understand. We cannot even begin to understand how wide a gap people here have to cross before that first contact with us. Since school, they are taught that the Pope is their greatest enemy, that the Jesuits are mankind's greatest enemies, that the Catholic Church is something quite terrible. That is how they were taught. Presently, with growing religious indifference, it is likely that it is less so, but up to now, that has been the case, from grandfather to father to son. Certainly, whatever class I come to, whether in a secondary or elementary school, I am always asked about the Carmel. What is it? How do you eat it? How do you look at it? For the majority of young people, it is on the one hand something strange, on the other, something that draws them, something atypical, outside the normal experience of life, unseen on television or indeed anywhere else. They would like to know why and what for, because so far they do not understand. It is as yet not written about in newspapers. To begin with, they ask, why so young? Often I am asked whether they could be snatched from there. Mainly it is boys who ask this question, keen on carrying away some of the girls. One should remember that for over 500 years, Norway has been Protestant, with no contact with Catholicism. For them, it is something strange and quite out of the ordinary. An impenetrable barrier has been built up, difficult or even impossible to breach, even today. It is beyond the comprehension of old people that one could be both human and a Catholic at the same time. I would like to say that I don't believe it is indifferent as to where a monastery chooses to situate itself. For it will always, even a contemplative monastery, have a certain amount of contact with the surroundings and the world around. And there you will find exchange of thoughts and a spiritual life. Such a monastery will always function as a spiritual power that radiates and has a meaning for the surrounding society. And this is how it has even been in Tromsø. I would think that most of the people who have come in contact with this monastery and who draw strength from it are non-Catholics. Yes, and it is also a fact that the Catholics in Norway are interested in what is going on in Tromsø. When we are in other places in Norway and meet Catholics, they ask, how is it going with the Carmelites and the monastery? And they want to know how it has been all the time. In a way, it has been followed up by all Norwegians. The first thing they ask us when we come to Oslo or Bergen or Trondheim or wherever we go is, how are the Carmelites doing? Everyone wants to know about the Carmelites. 
When asked why the sisters came here, our bishop often emphasizes that once one is here, one can see. And that is quite logical, that to be able to talk about a religious life, one has to be able to see it. The bishop says, I preach it, they live it. He is not afraid to say it, and it puts us under a very concrete commitment to go into Norwegian culture. Now that more and more people know that they can come to us, to the monastery church without any announcement, more and more of them do come, and usually later they also come to the parlor. <laughs> In our Lutheran church, we don't have much tradition with monastic life, and especially not as contemplative as the Carmelite sisters. So during the three years I have known them, I have understood ever more about what it means to live with the power of prayer. It was a great discovery for everyone that anyone can come and ring and ask for prayer. It was unknown or perhaps effaced from their memories. I remember when one day a Protestant pastor came and asked, do many people ask you for prayer? Because no one has asked me to pray for any concrete intention for many years. Yes, pastors come. They come for many reasons. For example, to talk or to take part anonymously in the recitation of the breviary or afternoon vespers. It's become a tradition that they come to the Easter Tridium. Some come to be taught how to pray, inner prayer. That is very important. They want to deepen their inner prayer through the richness that comes from the Carmel and its legacy. Thanks to the grace of God that has touched us, we want to help people meet God by the daily practice of Christian meditation. For example, a Protestant pastor came to us one day, asking that we pray that his wife bears a child. He had tried everything. The last thing that came to his mind was that he should come to us and ask for prayer. He told us that the decision to come had been a very difficult one. He prayed for humility, to be able to come and ask Catholic sisters for prayer. We told him that if it is the will of God, then a child will be born. But if not, then no amount of praying will help. Of course, we prayed for his intention, and so it came to pass that a child was born. They came to show him, straight from the hospital, even before going home. Now, whenever they visit us, they say that the child was born by our prayers. As it happens, this pastor also received a rosary from us. We told him exactly how to pray on it. He told us that he prays on it very regularly and that whenever he says a homily, he holds the rosary in his hand. He is a great believer in the power of prayer and particularly of the rosary.
Nasz cel naszego życia tutaj może jest jeszcze taki bardziej... The aim of our life here is made clearer and more concrete by the environment in which we find ourselves, by the people with whom we are in daily contact, and a sort of confirmation of this is the need to defend the lives of unborn children. ANN is a private organization which was started 20 years ago at the same time as Norway got the law that legalized self-determined abortion. There are done about 15,000 abortions each year in Norway, and that number has been rather stable these 20 years, except that there has been a slight decline in the last few years, and Tromsø is one of the regions of Norway with the highest abortion numbers. The ladies called us of their own free will, having learned about us from newspapers that wrote about something new that is happening in this town. It was completely their initiative. For us, it was something completely unexpected, in the sense that they were not asking for spiritual support on a one-off basis, but wanted a long-term working relationship that we should become their spiritual base in all their works and very difficult meetings. For us, at least, it started with purely practical matters. It has now become tradition that the sisters give us candles that they have painted so that we can give them to the new mothers that come here for the first time after having given birth to their child. Sisters paint them for us. We are painting the candles for free. This underlines our spiritual contribution. While we work, we pray for the particular mother. Through our Lord's intercession, hundreds of these candles have been painted, and that means that newly conceived human beings have received them. When the nuns give us candles that they have painted, maybe it is because they think it is nice to have so many small children visiting them. Yes, and it's good for the ones who have received them to see where they come from. We have worked like this for eight years now. This year at Easter, the ladies decided to prepare a surprise for us. And indeed, the surprise was great, because they came to visit us with, as they call, freshly baked mummies, a typical Norwegian saying with their children, that as they themselves admit, owe their lives to our prayers. It was a very emotional meeting for all of us. The mothers could see how we live, the way of our life, which impressed them greatly. It is a life full of sacrifice. They saw that our words were backed by concrete sacrifices day in, day out. On the other hand, it was a time of great rejoicing at the meeting of new life. Indeed, our monastery became filled like a small infant school. <laughs> When watching these images, we gain a better understanding of the meaning of Pope John Paul II's assertion when he reminds us that the contemplative orders are at the very heart of a praying church. In the faraway regions of Tromsø, 
We have found a concentrated form of something which we encounter elsewhere in a more diluted form. In the film, we contemplate something internal, which resembles a laboratory of the Holy Spirit. Virginal life becomes fertile. One can hear the silent testimony of these women who have devoted their lives to God, who spread the gospel in a much more efficient manner than with the stream of words. It is a fact that the 19 Polish Carmelite sisters have already generated two Norwegian vocations. Together, and thanks to their smiling faces, their work, their singing, they are Christ's missionaries at the frontiers of the Earth's coldest regions. Help us to help our charity to provide support for contemplative orders throughout the world. On the threshold of the third millennium of Christendom, the miracle of prayer will thus be able to spread its light like a shining candle.